Well, friends, I want to welcome you to Stillwater. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're just so thankful that you came out to worship Jesus here with us today. Uh, like Marie said earlier, we're in this series we're called Living the Five, and it's five things that really summarize the vision of what we're about here at Stillwater, how we're to live as individuals, how we're to live as a church. And uh, last week, we talked about the fact that you can't do life alone. God did not call us to try to be Lone Ranger Christians, but instead to be in community with each other through our community groups, uh, through attending worship, uh, through serving, through so many other areas. You can't do life alone. And this week we're talking about the reality that growing people change. Growing people change. And there's one word in that statement that kind of gives all of us a little bit of heebie-jeebies, right? That whole change word. Because that's not our favorite thing. I mean, there may be a few who just really like change in all aspects of life, but that's kind of rare, right? Most of us don't live life one day and have things go pretty well and say, you know what, tomorrow I hope it's all totally different, right? Because, yeah, that day was fine, but I don't like to do the same day twice. I'd want everything different. And when I go to a restaurant, I always order different things, right? And I I find a cell phone network that works for me, and next month I drop them and change to somebody else, right? Because I like change. We, We don't do that. We like things to kind of stay the same in so many ways. And, and, I, and so most of us couldn't honestly say, yeah, I like change or I'm looking for change. Uh, maybe some of us feel a little bit closer to uh, this cat in this picture here, right? So there's only two things I don't like, uh, change and the way things are. I'm not necessarily happy with life, but boy, please don't change it, right? I mean, because when it changes, that's a risk. Even if I'm not super happy with the way things are, what if we changed and it actually got worse? What if I like things even less? So, so we, we tend to, to resist change right there. Think about your own life. What, what, what areas do you really struggle with change? What holds you back from change? What, what fears or what concerns stop you from changing? You know, it's been said that nothing happens, nothing changes until the pain of remaining the same outweighs the pain of change. That kind of stinks, doesn't it? It's basically saying that life must get to a certain level of bad before we'd ever consider any change or improvement. Like, Take finance, for example. Let's say that things are going rough financially and you're, every month you're ending and there's, there's less money to pay the bills than there are bills, right? And so instead of making changes early, we often wait and we live in that month after month and we live off of the credit card or we go further into debt or we, we just blow all of our savings or whatever and we wait until things get downright terrible. Somebody comes and repossesses the car or we lose the house or some other financial problem. We say, well... I guess maybe I should change now. (laughs) Yeah, maybe we should have changed a long time ago. Maybe we should have had the courage to make those difficult decisions uh, earlier on. For followers of Jesus, that would really be a tragic way to live because Jesus actually calls us to change. Growing people change. Take, for example, I want to introduce you to Gabby Williams. Gabby's here. She's the baby there. Uh, Gabby is uh, uh, she's about 24 inches long, weighs 10 pounds. Uh, Gabby's parents love her very much. Uh, they change her diaper faithfully. She nurses every three hours. She's just exactly what you'd expect out of a baby maybe two, three months old. But the thing that's interesting about Gabby is she's not two or three months old. No, Gabby is 10 years old. She's 10 years old. She has a very rare condition. It's so rare, in fact, uh, doctors don't even have a name for it. You see, for Gabby, time goes on, but she's on a very different growth clock than the rest of us. While years and years may go by, she hardly grows. She hardly changes. Nikki in Florida has a similar condition. Nikki has the body of a 10-year-old, and yet Nikki is 40 years old. Imagine that. Imagine what it would be like if that were you or if that were one of your children. What a difficult thing to live through that that year after year, virtually nothing changes. And you know, while that's a rare physical condition, it's actually a very common spiritual condition. We go year after year after year and we hardly change at all. We hardly grow at all. We keep doing the same old stuff. We keep ignoring the things we need to do and doing the wrong things that we shouldn't do. And and it's like we get comfortable. We get cozy. 
And we, we would rather stay in that little cocoon than to launch out into those deep waters that God calls us to. We'd rather be comfortable than take the risk of growth, to take the risk of change. And it's a tragic thing. Because then we, we can follow Jesus for years. Maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for 15 years. And there are folks who have followed Jesus for 15 years. And they've got 15 years of growth and experience. And they look like the maturity of a 15-year-old follower. There's others who've been followers for 15 years. Except what they've done is they've repeated year one 15 times over. So they're not the maturity of a 15-year-old follower. No, they're just a very experienced one-year-old follower of Jesus. What a tragedy. That's not how God calls us to live because growing people change. That's why sometimes you can meet folks who've been around a church for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and they're still just as mean as a snake, you know? Not Stillwater people. Don't get me wrong. It's not happening here, clearly. But other churches, right? There's people that they're there and they, uh, they, they, we do this, right? Year after year and we don't, we don't respond to God's call to change. And so our lives don't look any different. And other people, they look at us and they say, really? You go to church? <laughs> I would never have guessed that about you. It's never a compliment, by the way. By looking at your life, I never would Where do you go? Stillwater Church? I'll be sure never to go there, right? Because you guys must not be real big on this application stuff, right? Because growing people change. We're called to change. The author of Hebrews puts it this way, Hebrews 5.12. You've been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others. But instead, you need someone else to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You're like babies who need milk, and cannot eat solid food. That's a great illustration, isn't it? It's comparing us to like spiritual babies. Say, imagine if you, so you went out for dinner with somebody, and you order your favorite menu item, and the waiter gets to them. They said, no, I'm good. I don't need to order anything. And the waiter leaves. They say, what are you going to eat? And they reach into their bag, and they pull out like some of those little Gerber foods, right? You're like, I'm good. I got my sweet potatoes and bananas. It's going to be awesome. (laughs) That's terrible, right? Who eats that stuff by choice? You know, I just... I never really got used to the whole, like, chewing food thing. You know, that's weird to me. So I'm just going to stick with my baby food. That'd be sick, wouldn't it? I mean, that would be, you probably would never go out to dinner with that person again because you'd be embarrassed, you know? It'd be weird. Let's not do that spiritually. That's not what God's calling us to. You see, if we're really walking with Jesus, he's going to be actively changing some things in our lives. So if we're not seeing change, that should be a red flag. If you look at your life, so it's January 2016, look back a year. If you say, you know what, spiritually and in terms of lifestyle and holiness, the way I'm living, I'm pretty much the same as I was a year ago. Then man, 2015 was a bummer of a year. Let's not make that mistake in 2016. I mean, you have the opportunity to grow closer and closer to Jesus. Let's not stay stagnant because Jesus is calling us to actively change in our lives. A uh, little uh, church participation here, okay? So we got a picture of a tree. Anybody know what tree this is? Not a palm tree. Get one out of the way for you. Anybody know what it is? I got a few guesses. I heard orange. I think somebody even said palm tree. I just told you it's not a palm tree, right? Come on. All right, next picture. Any Anybody on this one? Peaches. You're so much better at this one. Why? Yeah, it's got fruit on it, doggone it, doesn't it? They were both peach trees, right? The same exact tree, just a little bit closer up shot. But we know trees, at least people like me who don't know our fruit trees well at all. The only way I know what kind of a tree it is to see what kind of fruit is growing on it, right? I cannot look at a tree and just tell you what it is, but I can identify fruit pretty well. And and the Bible, Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 16. You can identify them, he's talking about people, by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. So Jesus is kind of making a little joke here, right? He's almost like saying, can, can you go to like some like weed with thistles and thorns on it and pick some strawberries off of it? No, that's not going to work. You, you can grow that thing every single year. It's never going to produce a berry. It's a weed, right? Every year it's going to make the same thing. And you know what? Your strawberry plants, they're never going to make thistles. It doesn't work that way. Good trees produce good fruit, or good plants produce good fruit. Uh, Bad plants produce bad fruit. So if you want to know if you're growing in your faith, 
It's not just a matter of like, oh, do I feel like I've grown? That, that's pretty subjective. Look at your lifestyle. Have you actually grown? Is there actually change? Would people say the spiritual fruit is different than it was the last year? Well, what spiritual fruit? Galatians 5 lists these fruits of the Spirit, these, these uh, fruits that our lives should be bearing. They're love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. These are fruits of the Spirit. Now think about those things in your life. Have any of them grown last year? If not, you really didn't grow spiritually, according to the Bible. And for most of us, we'd probably say, yeah, there were some of these that I grew in. There were others of these, not so much. I may have even gone backwards. I may be less patient than I was last year. And if that's you, it's all right, because God's not giving up on you, right? But let's not make the same mistake again. Let's, let's do things that will actually lead to fruit in our lives. You know, if we look at a, a guy named Paul, you remember him? We talked about him last week. He wrote a good chunk of the New Testament. He was one of the, the key uh, uh, people to spread our faith in the early days. He writes this in Philippians 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, this is Paul, right? Like, like super Christian guy, right? And he says, I want to understand Christ and the power of his resurrection as if he, he doesn't fully get it yet. Because growing people change. It's not just a matter that he learned the fact once and he had it. We grow into this more and more. Just like any human relationship, we grow closer in time. He continues in verse 12. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things so that I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and forgetting or er, and looking forward to what lies ahead i press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which god through christ jesus is calling us so he uses this metaphor and he says hey i'm not there yet i haven't arrived so if if paul hasn't arrived well i sure haven't i'm no paul and, and you probably haven't either because i'm guessing we don't have any pauls in our congregation if if he hasn't made it neither have we growing people change it's like he's, he's looking at his life almost like a marathon, right? Imagine if you're running a marathon and you're about mile 17 or so. They say you hit that wall and, and you're tired, you're worn out, you don't know if you can make it any further. You don't focus just on the pain of the past, because that kind of will bring you down. You don't focus just on the number of miles that you got to go, because there's still a long ways to go. But instead, we fast forward and we look at that finish line. We say, it's going to be awesome when I cross that thing. I'm going to feel so good. It's, it's, it's going to be such an accomplishment. I'm going to be able to tell my friends, I'm going to have this personal satisfaction that it was all worthwhile. This is how Paul looks at our lives as followers of Jesus, kind of like this race. And he says, that's how we should be living too. Because someday, all of us, we're going to stand before God. We're going to answer for the way we live. The first thing is, do we follow Jesus? Do we ask him to be our savior, to be our Lord? Because we can't just pay the price for our sins on our own. That's crazy. We need Jesus to forgive us, to to pay that price. And he did that for us. We just have to say yes to his gift. But then, how did we go on from there? With the remainder of our time here on earth, how did we live? How did we grow in those fruits of the Spirit? How are we going to answer God? for that. And you know, look, tough times in life, they're going to happen. If you're not going through tough times right now, then, then great, that's awesome. But it's going to happen, I promise. And the way that we navigate tough times has a lot to do with how we've grown in our faith. If, if tough times really just completely throw us off, a lot of times that's because we've got some growing to do. So if you're going through tough times, it's a great time to grow closer to Jesus because your, your sense of need for him is higher. Even though you always need him, you, you understand it a little bit more when times are tough. And if you're not growing, going through tough times, now's a, a great time to grow as well because it'll help you be prepared for when those difficult seasons come. So what do we do? What are some, some practical steps here as we, we begin this new year together? How do we actively follow Jesus? We're going to look at, at seven steps, seven activities that help us grow. And I'm guessing that when you go home today, you're probably not going to say, dang, that was all new information. I never knew any of that. Probably you've heard this before, or at least some of this, because it's like so many other things in life. 
It's all about implementation. You may know the right things to do, but if you don't actively do them, that knowledge doesn't really make any difference. So as we talk these things through, ask yourself, you know, how am I doing in this area? And if I'm doing great, awesome, high five, way to go. But if not, what's some ways that I could make some steps forward? Which of these is God calling me to move forward in? First thing is to read your Bible daily. Read your Bible daily. Now, I know I should just be able to stop and move on to number two, because we all know this. It's, it's not a shock, right? It's God's Word. He's given it to us. I mean, the God of the entire universe has given us His will laid out for us in, in this book. And, and yet we don't read it. So many times we don't read it. I can't tell you as a pastor how many times I'll meet folks and they'll be asking, how do I know God's will for my life? Well, how often do you read the Bible? I hear sermons at church, you know, I, I may every now and then read something or I see something somebody posts on Facebook, does that count or something? And we don't read it. And, you know, the Bible says, uh, Psalm 119, your word is, is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. If you want to know God's will for your life, start by reading God's word. Because God's will never contradicts God's word. And I, I love that metaphor of a light. You ever gotten up at night and you're, you're going to get something, right? You're, you're going to the bathroom or you're going to the refrigerator or whatever it is you do and, and you stub your toe on that piece of furniture. Man, that stinks. Or you step on that Lego, right? And you swear, I'm going to teach those kids. And uh, you had a light, it would have been a lot different, right? You could have seen that Lego, saved yourself all that pain and suffering. God's word is a lamp. And we oftentimes leave the light behind and we walk in spiritual darkness. We wonder why we don't feel close to Jesus. Well, start by reading. And maybe uh, you've never done this. Start, you know, uh, open up to one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, Stick your Bible beside your bed. Say, I'm going to read every morning when I wake up or every night when I go to bed. Even if I read for three minutes, I'm just going to, I'm going to open it up and read a few verses, put in a bookmark and start there tomorrow. Everybody can start somewhere. There's a whole lot of different ways uh, we can do that. Uh, my favorite way, uh, there's this app called Version. It's real simple. It's Bible.com, right? You can probably remember that between now and you go home. Or you can look in the, uh, the app store. Um, uh, but it is a great resource. It's a free resource. Um, all sorts of different translations. Better than that, there's Bible reading plans you can get on. Uh, and so it'll remind you if you're like me and you forget things. You need a little text to remind you or to email to your inbox, however you want. It's a tangible way of doing this. Because I doubt that many of us would say, I don't read the Bible because I don't think it's worth the time. There may be some, but I'm betting most of us would say, I don't read this because I forget. I, I just get busy with other things. And we need things to remind us of what's, what's important. Jesus said in Matthew 4, it's written, A man or woman should not live by bread or loan, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. It's like our spiritual food. Now think about it. Would you... Would you try to live on one meal a week? <laughs> I hope not. It's a bad plan, right? And if you're coming here at the church and, and you're listening to sermons and whatnot, at best, spiritually, you're living on one meal a week. I don't know about you, but I need to eat like every day. It's a big priority in my life. And, and we also need, uh, we need to uh, have that spiritual nourishment as well. Second thing, get baptized. If you're a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized, now's the time. Like, seriously, grab your Connect card. We've got sign-ups on there. Uh, talk to me afterwards. We would love to celebrate your baptism uh, because this is something Jesus commanded us to do. In fact, when, when he's giving kind of his final instructions to the disciples in, in Matthew 28, he says this. He says, go into all the world and, and preach the good news, right? Preach the gospel uh, and make disciples of all nations. And what's the first thing? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right? And I'm with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus is telling us that this is something we should do. Baptism, it's like this outward sign of an inward work of God. And as Methodists now, we, we only baptize people once, right? If you've been baptized, that's awesome. We don't need to do that again. God doesn't need any do-overs, that's for sure. But, but we celebrate baptism uh, because it's a way of saying in front of everybody, my church family, I want to follow Jesus. If you haven't done that, let's do that. Number three, 
Attend church regularly. Make it a priority in your life. Not just kind of, you know, once a month when, when the wind's not blowing the wrong way or whatever, but hey, when me and my family, when we're in town, we're, we're going to be at church uh, because, because it's important. Remember from last week, you can't do life alone. We looked at this verse from Hebrews uh, in, in chapter 10. It says, And let us not neglect meeting together as the habit of some is, uh, but instead uh, let us encourage one another, especially now that Jesus, the day of Jesus' return is drawing near. So we should be meeting together uh, because we encourage each other. We support each other. We need that. And I know you may be saying, yeah, but I can worship God on the golf course or the, the bass boat or the hunting stand. You're right. You can and you should. But why on the earth would that be your exclusive way of worshiping God? That certainly does not substitute for being in a community of believers. That doesn't substitute for the accountability that we can have for each other. That doesn't substitute for worshiping God together. It doesn't su- substitute for, for learning things that, that maybe you wouldn't have stumbled on on your own accord out there doing whatever you do. Worship God wherever you go. But, but, but we need to, to worship together because we can't do life alone. It's, it's kind of going to be a little gross, but think about it this. Like, let's say you were in a tragic car accident and, and like your, your arm was severed, right? Terrible tragedy, right? Uh, now, if that happened to me, I would hope that there would be some really good like heads up EMT guys who showed up, right? And these, these men and women would take good care of me and they'd, they'd take that arm and take it with me to the hospital so we could like put it back on, right? Because I really like both of these, right? I'm not looking to lose one. And if something's severed from the body, it's not going to live. It's not going to make it. And spiritually, when we sever ourselves from the body, it's a matter of time before we start falling further and further away. Because we have less accountability, we have less encouragement, we have less support, and our lives look less and less like Jesus. And we kid ourselves. We tell ourselves, oh no, I'm, I'm still good. I still believe in God and all that. Sure, of course we do. But we're not growing as we should be. Because we're cutting ourselves off from one of the main source, uh, sources of growth. The idea that you can follow Jesus and not be in a community of believers goes against like hundreds of verses in the Bible and thousands of years of church history and Christian experience. You can't do life alone. Fourth thing, repent genuinely. Repent genuinely. And I don't mean like, oh, I got caught, I'm sorry, you know, I'll probably do it again, but well, I'm sorry, I probably should say that, right? No. Genuine repentance means it's like an about face, right? You're going in one direction and you turn and go the other way. It's looking at my own sin and saying, oh, God, I I hate this stuff. I I don't want to continue in it. I need your help. I need you to help me change. And, And we all struggle with sin. It's part of of this experience of following Jesus. The question is, where's your heart in that struggle? In your heart, have you just kind of given it up? Have you given up the fight and said, well, I'm going to accept that I've got these areas of my life that honor God, and then this one or these two or these three that just, it's not going to happen. So Jesus, congrats, you get the majority of me, but this piece over here, not going to be your territory. I'm going to manage this. The word for that is idolatry. You know, in the Bible, we look at the Israelites in the Old Testament. They would often fall away from God because they'd worship idols. And we say, well, I don't do that. I don't have like some like, you know, item in my house that I bow down to and pray to. No, we're not talking about, that's, that's not how you and I practice idolatry. How we practice idolatry is it's a sin. It's, it's something that we allow to continue to reside in our lives. Something that doesn't please Jesus something contrary to his will, and we allow it to stay there, and we choose to do nothing about it. We choose to not have accountability. We choose to not try to make those steps uh, towards, towards changing that. We choose to not genuinely repent. And the thing about the Israelites is, it was very rare that they would actually say things where they were like giving up on their God. Instead, their mistake, it's kind of like our mistake, they would try to hedge their bets and, and, and worship God, but also worship idols at the same time. Like remember that, that God Baal that they always struggled with. What the deal was, was they had their God, the one true God, but Baal was a God worshipped by some of their neighbors, and, and Baal was believed to be the God of rain. The Israelites were farmers. They said, you know, we, yeah, we believe in God and all that, that's great, that's awesome, he brought us out of Egypt, yada yada, but, but Baal, his specialty is supposed to be rain. 
And what if that could actually help? So it's not that we don't like God, but we're also going to worship Baal, right? Because we need the rain. We're farmers. That's important. So we're going to try to kind of synchronize, do both of these things. And God hated that. God actually, ironically, took the rain away for many years just to show I'm better than Baal. Baal, false god. What, what idols are, are you allowing to live in your life? We need to repent genuinely. James 5.16, confess your sins to one another. Pray for each other, the Bible says, so that you may be healed. Isn't it interesting that it ties confession repentance to, to healing? I'd say both physical and spiritual healing. I mean, if you want to be healed from the causes of your sins, you got to confess these things. Because Jesus is <laughs> he's not going to force you to quit. You're a human being with free will. You got to make the choice if you really want to confess, if you really want to repent genuinely. You know, if you've got an idol in your life, you may find that you hear about it a lot. You may say, every time I come to church, John, he's always he's talking about gossip or he's talking about whatever it may be. And the reason why you you feel that way is because the Holy Spirit is poking at you. When you tolerate an idol, you're going to find that you're going to hear about that thing more and more. And and it's God calling you and saying, listen, let's deal with this. I love you. I want all of you. I don't want part of you. I don't want to be a part-time Lord of your life. That doesn't work. I want to be full-time Lord, leader of your life. And, And you know, just... Just to be real straight with you, if if you continue to worship that idol year after year and you truly don't care, you got to ask, am I really following Jesus? Do I really care about that? We all wrestle with sin, don't get me wrong, but if you just have said, I don't care anymore, I'm just going to, this is how it's going to be, then you're lacking some key fruit in your life, that that, that need for genuine repentance. If we're growing, there needs to be fruit, because growing people change. We'll have bad days. We'll have bad seasons. But how's the process of growth going for you? Fifth, give wholeheartedly. Matthew 6, 21 and 24, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there may your heart be also, right? And he says, you cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. You heard this many times. We talk about tithing, giving 10% of our income back to God. That's a challenge. Sometimes we have to be on this kind of uh, pace of progress there, right? Where little by little we're growing there. But how are you doing with growth? Because he says, I love this contrast he makes. He says, there's like two masters. You can't serve both God and money. Now, thankfully, slavery is not a part of our culture here in America. So this concept of masters is weird. But... Think of it this way. Can you cheer for Ohio State and Michigan at the same time? No. No, we got a video about that, right? I think. Let's see if this thing will work. Oh, have you been on a lot of blind dates? Um, well, this would make one. Oh, (laughs) me too. What do you do? I'm a vet. I love animals. Really? Yeah. Where are you from? Michigan. Born and raised. Go Blue! Go Buckeyes! Go Buckeyes! There's a man who's got his priorities together, don't you think? I mean, you gotta have standards, you gotta have lines, right? That's that's silly, but but if we feel that way about sports, gosh, how would we not feel this way about other things? And God's saying, you cannot have money and God both as number ones in your life. One of them's got to take a leading position. If you look at your checkbook, if you look at your, your, your spending last year, what does it reflect? Does it reflect growth in Christ? Or does it say, eh, I've just decided this is going to be one of those idle areas, right? Where, God, you know, I know you call me a tithe. I know this, blah, blah, blah. But I'm just going to ignore that. I'm going to do it my own way. The Bible calls that robbing God, which is pretty strong language, don't you think? I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that on an ongoing basis. So what could I do to step forward more? Uh, How could I be more faithful in in giving wholeheartedly? Sixth thing, sixth thing, tell others faithfully. I mean, I mean, tell others faithfully. Uh, that's such an important par- uh, part of this. In fact, we're going to de- devote a whole week to this concept of find, found people, find people. But, but briefly, if, if you know Jesus, 
why would you not be telling others? I mean, if you found a great restaurant that you like, you'd tell your friends. If, if you heard that your favorite band was going to be in the area, you'd call your friends who also like that band. If you join a new health club that you love, you're going to tell others, say, hey, why don't you come with me? This place is great. We do that. That's what normal people do. And so when we, we're followers of Jesus, we want to tell others. We want to invite others into relationship with him. One of the easiest ways is by inviting them to come to church. And you know, I got to say, church, I'm just, I continue to be so proud of Stillwater Church and how we keep growing in this. Uh, we challenge you to do this on a regular basis. Uh, one time recently, about a month ago, it was Christmas Eve, right? And we did something interesting this year. We changed, uh, before we had had our kids singing at three of the different services, which is great. We love having our kids sing. But this year, we, they did a musical ahead of time, and we didn't have them sing during the services. Well, we knew, you know, think about numbers, that's going to hurt attendance, right? Because it used to be those kids would kind of like triple attend, right? So, you know, that's, that's okay. That happens in churches all across America. But it, it makes your numbers go up some. They said, okay, Christmas Eve, it could actually go down because those kids and their families, that's a lot of people, right? And we challenge challenge you, you know, um, not because of that, uh, but, but because we want others to know Jesus, we challenge you to invite others and say, hey, bring your friends. And you know what happened? We grew over last Christmas Eve, even though we didn't have the kids singing, right? And, you know, that was over last year. And guess what? Last year we grew over last year, the year before, right? Because you keep inviting people. Our church grows because you invite people. You know, last night I, I did this illustration I said that, you know, the reason why people come to church is because you invite them. If you ask most everybody around here, they're going to, they say they showed up here because you invited them. And last night I said, you know, nobody, I don't know of anybody in the history of my time as a pastor who said, hey, I heard that John Ferguson was pastor of that church and I just had to show up, right? I've met zero of those people, right? It doesn't happen, you know? Okay, so after, we're, after church last night, somebody comes up to me and she goes, well, you know, your sermon, it was, it was good, but it wasn't really true. So what do you mean? She goes, I came here because of you. I said, what? She says, this is my first Sunday here. And, and well, long story short, I'm connected with their church through our conference, like I'm helping in their consultation process. Remember, we went through that. So I'm one of their coaches because they're, they're having to downsize their staff. We had to do that, right? She's like, the only reason I came here was because I know you through that. So that's not really true anymore. You just ruined one of my favorite illustrations. Come on. Why didn't you stay home, right? Yeah. She didn't like that at all. But I didn't say that. But regardless, people don't come here for me. They come here because you invite them, right? That's why our church grows, because our people are so great at inviting. And I just can't wait to see how God's going to use this more and more. And, and we're being faithful to God's call. Because in Philemon 1.6, Paul says this, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you may have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. That's part of how we know or how we show our, our sincerity and our relationship with Jesus is we share about it with others. Last thing, number seven, serve enthusiastically. I mean, sometimes we think, hey, if I just show up at church, I get that little heavenly check mark right and on to the next thing. But, you know, God's calling us to serve. Stillwater, we've got great opportunities for this. Out at our Connection Center, we've got our opportunities guides. If you're not connected in serving, don't leave here today without stopping and grab one, grabbing one of those and saying, God, how would you call me to serve? And you know what, if we don't have something on there that's a fit for you and God's laying something on your heart, talk to us. Because a lot of our best ministries, they're started simply because God spoke to one of our folks. Uh, Marie and Tyler were telling you about men of God uh, breakfast, right? That's all because somebody at Stillwater said, I think God's calling me to, to start this thing. Dave, Dave Whitesall, he said, I think God's calling me to start this thing. He attends our Y campus. We said, let's do this. Let's figure this out. Our, pretty soon we're going to have a, uh, a prom for special needs children, right? And uh, that, that happened uh, because Sue Hay came to us. And again, one of our folks here at Stillwater and said, I think God's calling us to reach out to families with special needs. That's how churches grow. That's how great ministry happens. That's how God speaks to our church. And you know, if you're not fully engaged, I can't wait for you to become fully engaged because then we'll become more and more faithful to who Jesus is calling us to be as a church. If you're kind of sitting in the stands watching this thing go by, we're missing out here at Stillwater. We're missing out on the great gifts and talents that you bring. Growing people serve too. You know, 
I was thinking back, when, when I was in preschool, I, I showed up at preschool every day, right? And I came in, I played with the stuff, I ate a snack, did whatever else, and went home, right? Same cycle every single day. If I miss a day of preschool, it just means one less kid to watch after, one less snack to give, right? That's normal. That's like little kid level uh, involvement in education, okay? And that's fine when you're a little kid. That's not fine as you get older. When I went to college, it was different. I wasn't just a consumer of the product. I was a participant in the, in the whole thing. I, I played on the soccer team. I served in student government. I helped to plan events for the campus. I was in, involved in student life in the dorm, all these kind of things. If I would have disappeared from the college, it would have been different, right? And, and that's because we grow. It's the same thing at church. You know, when you, when you first start following Jesus, you may not be real involved, but as you grow, you should become more and more involved. Because that's the natural part of the process. First Peter 4, each one of us should use whatever gift he or she has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Growing people change. Think back to these seven. You got them written down there in your notes. What's God calling you to grow into this week? Don't, don't just go home and say, oh, that was cute, you know, whatever, and then go on and do the same thing. Because if so, you'll be exactly the same place next year that you are now. That would be a tragedy. That would be a missed opportunity on the limited number of days that God gives you here on this earth. Let's use them well. I hope that you're getting to grow with your group as well. Uh, if you weren't here last week, we told you how we've got a great study that goes along with this. Uh, we've got an ebook that we, we've put together here. In fact, it's got lots of great pictures of Stillwater folks. I think we got a picture of this. Um, that, that, uh, that's just one page from it. Um, if you haven't gotten it, you should have gotten an email on Monday about that. If not, that means you're not on our email list. So grab your Connect card right now. Put your email on that. We'll add you tomorrow. Uh, so you'll receive that this week. Um, we've got, uh, so the, the book you can access electronically. Uh, there's a quick video from me that's there on YouTube. There's a link for that. Uh, you can study these together right there with your group. Uh, if you don't have a group, you can grab some buddies and study together or grab people in your family. Don't do this thing alone uh, and, and study together. We've made it really easy for you to do that, to receive that stuff. If you don't have a computer, if you've got like no access to that, stop at the Connection Center. We've got just a handful of these printed off uh, if you don't have access to that. But, but folks, like we said last week, you can't do life alone. And as we go through this series, let's take some time to kind of study on our own so that God can help us to grow. Would you pray with me?